Well, Dr. Anthony Daniels is also known under the name Theodore Dalrymple. He's a retired physician who practiced in a British inner city hospital and a prison at the same time. Uh, he's also a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a contributing editor of City Journal. He's written a column for London-based The Spectator for many years, writes for the National Review. One editor I saw called him the Orwell of our time. Uh, and Dr. Daniels is the author under the name Theodore Dalrymple of the book Life at the Bottom, The Worldview That Makes the Underclass from 2003, a uh, 2012 book, well, many books, but uh, the ones that I noticed, uh, Spoilt Rotten, The Toxic Cult of Sentimentality, and author of Admirable Evasions, How Psychology Undermines Morality from 2015, and I want to come back to that book. But above all, Tony Daniels is a very decent chap, and I know that because I helped host him and his wife Agnes back in 2006, actually the first year of Family First, when he was invited down here by Garth McVicker and the Sensible Sentencing Trust to talk about crime and its contributing factors. So, uh, Tony, welcome back to New Zealand, albeit online, uh, and you're coming, you. you're coming from a little village in, in England, is that correct? A little town, a little town, yes. Okay. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, prison, rehabilitation, deterrent, uh, punishment, New Zealand is going through the process. The government wants to repeal what they call the three strikes law, which I know you're familiar with. They argue that judges should have flexibility, have the final say on sentences, not be dictated to. But under all of this is the ideology that prisons don't work. Punishment doesn't work. Deterrence is a myth. And we're just kicking people while they're down. But but the data I've looked at suggests that actually it is working. Less than 5% of offenders are moving on to the next strike. So yeah. deterrence seems to be working, and if deterrence doesn't work, victims and the public know that they'll be kept safe from these serial and serious offenders for a much longer period because you can't commit a crime while in prison. So perhaps I could kick it off by asking you the question, people say prisons are a failure. Who thinks that, and why do they think that? Well, a lot of people think that, and I think that... Uh probably the majority of uh, the intellectual class, if I may so put it, thinks that. Uh, apart from anything else, uh, I was on a debate with a former Lord Chief Justice of uh, England, uh, and the motion was that prison works, and I was speaking for the motion, and he was speaking against it. But it's rather odd that a man whose system uh, has sent thousands of people to prison should say that prison doesn't work, because if that is so, uh, then, what, then what he's doing is depriving people of their liberty uh, for no good reason. Um, and when people say prison doesn't work, uh, do they mean that if there were no prisons at all, there were no possibility of anyone being sent to prison, uh, we would be safer, uh, that uh, there should be no prisons at all? Uh, what they mean, of course, is prisons don't work as well as they should, but mm. then nothing works as well as it should. Mm. Um, but, but, but in any case, the evidence to me suggests that they do actually work. Uh, we know that the recidivism rate in Britain, I'm talking about Britain, I've lost a bit of touch with uh, New Zealand, but I don't think New Zealand is all that different in this respect from Britain. We know that the recidivism rate is very high for short sentences. And never once has I, have I seen anyone suggest that maybe uh, the solution is longer sentences. So I've never, seen, I, I've never seen that in a newspaper, for example. Yeah. So is it that they don't like prisons full stop or they just don't think that prisons are working the way they should? I think the problem is there's no intellectual kudos in saying that punishment actually works because it makes anyone who says that sound as if he's punitive, censorious, uh, cruel, sadistic, and so forth. Hmm. And, uh, and therefore, uh, if you say the opposite, you sound the opposite of those things, which is understanding, kind, decent, and so on. Um, but the people who generally say this are are the people who are at very little risk themselves of serious crime. And even, for example, if my house were broken into and, um, and people stole things from it, I would, of course, dislike it intensely. But it wouldn't be devastating for me as it's devastating for poor people yeah. to have the same thing happen to them. 
So you have uh, you worked what fifteen years in as a psychiatrist in both the prison and the hospital. Uh, you sort of went between the two, as I understand it. Yes. And they, they resembled each other quite strongly, actually. And there was more, generally speaking, there was more violence in the hospital. But um, uh, uh, yes, I, I, I worked as a general doctor, so I was on 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 night duty one night in three or four for right. about fourteen weeks and weekends. So, do you think prisons work as well as they should? Uh, no, not really, because um, I think the, the revolving door principle where one has, I mean, it's easier in England, apparently, to find someone with 43 convictions than with one conviction mm. in a British prison. In other words, uh, what we do is uh, we give very light sentences to people who have made it quite clear that they're going to repeat uh, their um, uh, their offences. Uh, not that I think that uh, people should be punished for what they might do; they should be punished for what they have done. And this is a, a, a this is a mistake. Of course, that undermines the very idea of parole, actually. Yeah. But. Um, uh, uh, so they don't work as well as they, they should, but as I point out, that when people make comparisons between community sentences and, <clears throat> and prison sentences, usually they use a bogus statistic in order to show that there's either no difference or that it's favourable to, to community sentences. First, people, the vast majority of prisoners, at least in Britain, and I wouldn't mind betting it's the same in New Zealand, have already been through the community sentence. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty hard uh, to get into prison in New Zealand. It's pretty hard, yes. yes. Yeah. And in Britain, the police are saying, Hompson, you almost have to want to, <laughs> because <laughs> you, the, the chances of the police catching you are minimal, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, it is true that there are quite, I mean, this is a terrible indictment of our society, no doubt, but there are quite a lot of prisoners who say that they prefer life in prison to life outside, at least for a time. Hmm. So, so, <clears throat> so the fact that the, I mean, the argument that's used is because of the recidivism, uh, that suggests that prisons aren't doing their job. Is that a fair summation? That is uh, one of the arguments, yes, and, and, and it's a bogus argument, actually. Uh, if, you take, uh, if I go back to the, the comparison between the, um, uh, between the, the uh, community sentence and the uh, prison sentence, mm. the community sentence, uh, the recidivism rate is measured from the moment of sentence. Right. The... With the prison, it's from the moment of release. Mm. So you don't count the fact that while they've been in prison, they haven't been committing crimes at least against uh, members of the wider community. Mm. So that's a bogus thing anyway. And, and as I said, you can't really do like for like because almost all prisoners have gone through, um, have gone through the, uh, the, the community system already. Yeah. In fact, many times, and it's possible to demonstrate in Britain, and I wouldn't be surprised if it were the same in New Zealand, that quite a large percentage of crime, in fact, a high percentage of crime, is committed by people who are already on community sentences. Well, one of the arguments used is that we should actually do away with prisons, uh, that prisons don't work, and it should all be community-based sentences, but... Does, that just continues to put... I mean, the argument for that is that you keep people in as much as possible, in normal setting as possible, you can rehabilitate them, uh, but does that actually work? No, no. I mean, we already know that community sentences, what are they going to do? They can't even follow them up. I mean, in Britain anyway, mm. the uh, public uh, administration is so degenerate that even when you put electronic bracelets on them, <laughs> you can't... You can't <laughs> You don't know that they're committing an armed robbery with yeah. a bracelet on. So I mean, it's not—it's just nonsense. And already we know that those people uh, who are on community sentences are committing thousands and thousands and thousands of crimes mm. as they are on those community sentences. In in Scotland, not some time ago, and this is a little while ago, but I don't see why it should have changed, they discovered that I think about a third of crimes are committed by people who are on bail. Right. 
Well, the, so, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, and that, that's the same in New Zealand. That, that, and that was part of the uproar and the des- desire for three strikes was because they were seeing people who were on parole or on bail committing other crimes. In fact, um, you know, I've just recently done an oral submission on the three strikes, and, and we found that people on two strikes, they'd actually had an average of about 45 convictions. Those on three strikes were averaging around 70 convictions. So we are really dealing with those career criminals, aren't we? We're trying to say, change your career, or it's longer prison time. I mean, the fact is, of course, certain the statistics bear this out. I mean, the prisoners used to tell me what they'd actually done, not what they had been um, accused of having done. Right. Uh, and it was... <laughs> it was a lot bigger, <laughs> was it? <laughs> it, was, it was, well, between five and 20 times as much. Hmm. And the, and the statistics bear this out because, of, as we know, I don't know what the clear the police clear up rate is in New Zealand, but in Britain it's something like five point five percent. And uh, I worked it out. I mean, my statistics might be slightly out of date because I've lost a bit of touch with all this kind of thing. But I worked it out that a, a, the average burglar in Britain can expect to spend three days. I think it was three days in prison for each burglary. Well. I mean, the question then becomes why there's so few burglaries, because it's actually it's pretty not why there are so many. <laughs> because surely uh, even an incompetent burglar should be able to take as much, you know, more than three days' labour uh, away from a burglary. So, so one of the arguments made by academics, criminologists, is that, um, well, actually I, I quoted one paper to the select committee that uh, was being quoted by supporters of repealing the three strikes, and they were trying to argue that actually if you don't punish people, they're less likely to commit crime in future. This is serious research papers that are, that are coming out. Um, and, and so, I mean, criminologists seem to say that all we're doing is we're creating a breeding ground by putting uh, bad people with bad people. It's, it's a training ground. No, I think the evidence is the opposite. And actually what you find is that the longer the prison sentence, the lower the recidivism rate, which is a finding that could surprise only criminologists. <laughs> it takes a while to learn that, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, yes, it does take a lot of education and training to be able not to see the obvious. And um, so, I, I, I mean, this is nonsense. I mean, in that case, they, they might as well, if you say we're not going to punish anybody, then you might as well not have any laws either. I mean, it's... Well, my, my colleague who's a ex-policeman, he actually made a submission as well. And his understanding is that actually criminals are made out to be no self-control, just can't help themselves, uh, no logic, can't think ahead, can't think of the consequences. And yet he was arguing that, no, they do their sums, they do their, <clears throat> um, they're actually quite smart and they know the consequences. And when three strikes came in, they realised that, hey, next time it's going to be quite a harsh consequence. Is that, is that yeah. correct? Or, or can, do criminals have no self-control? Well, I, I dare say you can find a few criminals who don't have any self-control because you can find anything in any large population of people. Mm. But the idea that they don't know what they don't really know what they're doing mm. is is nonsense. Mm. It's, it's, it's it's rubbish. Um, and uh, uh, the I to give you an example, I, I, I mean, I've never said anything in my writings. Uh, that I didn't say to prisons. Right. So I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't saying one thing in the prison and another thing in my writing. Well, the prisoners were all perfectly capable of understanding what I was saying. Now, they're supposed to be of low intelligence by comparison with the general population. That supposed is, to be. Supposed to be. Mm. All I can say is if that is the case, nevertheless, their intelligence is sufficient to understand what I'm saying. Mm. And maybe what I'm saying isn't very intelligent. I don't know. That's a possibility. But nevertheless, they seem to me to be perfectly capable of grasping everything that I said. Mm. And um, now you could say, well, they don't have any impulse control. But actually what one discovers anyway is that they rehabilitate themselves in a way. Mm. uh, Because, uh, again, 
if you look at the figures, um, you see that actually this is all a very young man's game, this kind of behavior. It's a risk behavior. Uh, yes, yeah. 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 And, and so three strikes works on the basis of deterrence. We're trying to deter yeah. them moving on to the next strike. But criminologists, academics, they say yeah. deterrence doesn't work, Theodore. <laughs> well... So, so, for example, uh, if we take the speed limit, if we took off all speed limits, no one would drive any faster. Mm. If there were not the possibility of being caught by the police and, uh, mm. and having your licence taken away, we would all drive within current speed limits spontaneously. Well, that's what that research uh, paper that was quoted, <laughs> that I quoted to the politicians, was trying well, to I mean, argue. <laughs> If you can believe that, you can believe anything. Yeah, well, I said, try and run that past parents who are trying to raise a defiant young <laughs> child, that if you don't punish them, punish them, they're not going to be bad. Yeah. Well, that's because they believe that fundamentally everyone is good and that really it's a society. I mean, they will talk right. about root causes of crime. And actually what they, what they misunderstand is that there's a difference between what prevents people from becoming criminals in the first place and what you do with criminals once they have become criminals. Uh, these things overlap, but they're not identical. Right. So obviously we don't want a society in which people do not behave in a criminal fashion only because uh, there's a policeman around the yeah. corner who will nab you and you'll go to prison if you yeah. break a law. You don't want a society like that, of no. course. Nobody wants that, and in fact, we don't have it. Yeah. Uh, we don't have such a society. Um, but on the other hand, you have to be realistic. Uh, as you have mentioned, uh, I saw something that you've done, uh, you mentioned New Zealand in 50 years went from being an almost as crime-free society, actually, as crime-free as any large well, fairly large-scale society can be, uh, to being a high-crime society. I remember looking at statistics in New Zealand uh, when I was in New Zealand, and these are a bit old, but in I think it was in 1950, hmm. when the population was about half of what it is now, there were 200 violent crimes known to the police. Hmm. And 50 years later, there were 70,000. Well, the population had hmm. doubled, so it was 35,000. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, you can uh, talk about how these things are measured, but this is a very... Uh, I mean, it's impossible not to be startled by that kind of change. Yeah. So victimisation uh, records show that about one in three New Zealanders are a victim of some form of crime uh, in a 12-month period at least once. The, the, the whole debate around prisons, punishment, uh, criminal activity seems to be around the human rights of the offender, and yeah. one thing that I pointed out in my oral submission on this law was that in the Human Rights Commission submission, they never once used the word victim. It was all about the human yeah. rights of the offender. Why, yeah. why have we lost the whole perspective around the human rights of victims and of the community, of people who live on their own that feel very vulnerable? What about their human rights? Why have we lost that? That side of the debate. Well, I think it, 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 it actually boils down again to the uh, to the desire of the intellectual class to appear virtuous. And as I said, you don't you um, appear virtuous by trying to understand the criminal. Uh, you, you, there's no virtue in uh, commiserating with the uh, with the victim. But um, but, I, but I find that quite ironic. I mean, it seems crazy that you there's more sympathy for the offender than there is for the victim. Well, this has been uh, this has actually been going on for a very long time. I mean, if you uh, in in literature, for example, uh, Victor Hugo wrote a book, The Last Day of the Condemned Man, mm. and it's a very very good book. I recommend anyone to read it. Mm. But what one doesn't learn in this is what the condemned man has actually done. So, 
<laughs> so we are we commiserate with the, the condemned man, but for all we know, the condemned man is a, a serial killer. Yeah. We we have no idea what he's done. So this is a, a temptation particularly strong for intellectuals, I think, mm-hmm. the intellectual class. Uh, I mean, partly because intellectuals, by definition, have to think differently from the man in the street, as it were. Otherwise, no point in being an intellectual. <laughs> 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 so, otherwise they're not needed yeah so so i mean the the uh message that is pushed is that it's poor people it's minority groups it's disadvantaged that end up in prison and that's why prisons are so mean because we're just kicking well, them that's ridiculous. Out. it's ridiculous because the victims come from the same groups and since the number of victims is very much greater than the number of perpetrators even in crime ridden areas hmm. Uh, yes. it's, it's simply not the case that if you don't incapacitate the, uh, the, uh, the perpetrator, you are being nice to the poor. Actually, what you're doing is victimising them. One could, I mean, if one were cynical or Marxist, one could interpret laxity as the means by which the middle classes avoid expenditure on law enforcement, except that, of course, law enforcement is very expensive, where a lot of crimes, preventable crimes, are being committed. Hmm. So it's possible to, 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 to in fact, more realistic, to turn it round. It's right. for the poor people who are victims of crime. This is perfectly hmm. obvious. Hmm. Yeah, and the statistics yeah. bear that out, that, uh, you know, the complaint is that uh, Māori are more likely to be represented in prison, but unfortunately Māori are also more likely to be yeah. victims of crime because uh, of the areas that they live in. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the fact is that most... I think people think that uh, burglars go around burgling... Uh, country houses and rich people's houses and of course there are a few specialised burglars who do that you know, who specialise in stealing works of art and so on and they're specialised but this is not the kind of crime that is plaguing um, our cities it's it's um, lower level uh, but often violent crime and uh, as you say it's perfectly obvious from the statistics who is suffering most from this and and do you think some people actually want to go to prison? Uh, yes, I mean uh, for a time. I mean they don't want they don't want to go to prison for years and years, but they they actually don't. I mean in in my um, experience, uh, they I would say to them uh, confidentially how how do they like prison, hmm. and um, and they say well for a time it, it's a relief to them. Because their lives outside, I mean, it is true that their lives are terrible. I mean, they, they made them terrible. Uh, they, um, they have all kinds of problems. Um, and, and it's almost, uh, you know, conditions in prison, and I'm in favour of this, prisons uh, conditions have improved by comparison with what they were. And, um, and it comes as a relief to them. So where does rehabilitation fit in? I mean, is that part of the prison experience? Should rehabilitation be happening? Well, first of all, if you give short... I mean, if you believed in prison rehabilitation, it wouldn't make sense to give short sentences because you can't... Whatever you do, you can't possibly do it in three months or six hmm. in that time. Uh, and I'm... Although I don't think the evidence shows very much um, anything uh, very dramatic as far as uh, prison rehabilitation is concerned, I think it is actually a kind of moral obligation on society to attempt it, whether it works or not, yeah. you know, to find new methods. In fact, as I said, prisoners do actually rehabilitate themselves because when you look at the multi-recidivists, they do actually eventually, most of them, not of course 100% of them, but most of them do actually stop uh, before the age of 39. Right. So they they will stop one way or another, and after that, either either that they cease to be criminal, or they're better at being criminal and never get caught again. But I don't think that's likely to be the explanation. Yeah. So in a sense, people are auto rehabilitating. So if you put that together, you might say, well, the the, the answer is longer prison sentences. Hmm. 
I mean, it's ridiculous to be giving three months to people who uh, who have committed uh, 40 offences, many of them quite serious offences. And here it's important to remember that while it is true that there are petty criminals who don't go on to commit serious offences, those who commit serious offences also commit petty offences. Right. So... So if uh, if someone who's committed a serious offence commits a petty offence, that's a serious sign. It should be taken seriously. Is crime uh, simply an indication of poverty? Does poverty cause crime? No, not in any direct sense. I mean, you you know, if you... uh, If you... It is true, of course, that in any given society, the kind of crimes we're talking about, burglary or assault and so on, are much more common amongst the relatively poor people. Mm. But if you compare societies, it's not the poorest societies that necessarily have the highest levels of crime, nor is it true that when those societies were poorer, much poorer than they are now, as most societies were, um, uh, that uh, crime goes down with poverty. Actually, Sweden, which no one could possibly call uh, poor, has one of the highest crime rates in Europe. Um, so, and uh, uh, if you take New Zealand, I don't believe it's poorer now than it was in 1950. Well, that must be nonsense. If you take New Zealand, I mean, it's not uh, the, the, there's a high rate of crime amongst by the Maori, uh, but that can't, it's not there being Maori that is important because. Uh, in 1950, they were also mad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When they were not committing crimes. Yeah. So something has changed in people's mentality. I can't actually, uh, I can't say, well, here's the answer. I know the answer. This is why people have changed from being law abiding uh, to being more criminally inclined. That's okay. Yeah. And so those who support three strikes law, tougher sentencing, they would argue that the West. In general, the West, including Sweden, the UK, um, have been too soft on crime. What's yeah, your response I think, to that phrase, too soft on crime? Well, I think for many years this is true. And over and over and over again, we see cases, dreadful cases, which, are, which people will say, well, these are isolated cases, where uh, absurd leniency, absolutely absurd leniency hmm. has been exercised. And, of course, someone will say, oh, well, that's only in the newspaper sensationalizing it. But, but this actually is a, 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 a statistical trend. In Britain, for example, in 1900, there was one prisoner for every 6.5 uh, indictable crimes. And 100 years later, there were 114 indictable crimes per prisoner. So, in other words... Uh, we have become much, much more uh, lenient. Mm. And again, it takes a criminologist to be surprised (laughs) that... uh, (laughs) Well, it shows you that criminals are good gamblers because they can figure out the odds of being caught. Yes, I think think they they can be. And uh, in a sense there... In a sense, they restrain themselves because there really is very few, or many people restrain themselves. So Um, I guess one area of commonality that we have, uh, both sides of this debate, is that we all want to keep people out of prison. We don't want them to end up in prison because we don't want them committing crimes. How do we do that? Is that possible to stop that recidivism? Uh, You know, what would be your strategy? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm in favour of longer prison sentences for uh, for recidivists. I mean, so long as uh, so long as you have a a proper uh, system of fair trial and so on. Right. I mean, that's I mean, that's what people should be concentrating their um, um, uh, the human rights people should be concentrating on. In Britain, for example, we re- we changed, and I was against this, we changed the uh, the warning that is given to someone who's arrested. Hmm. Uh, um, uh, uh, it used to be quite simple, anyone can understand it. It said, uh, you know, you don't have to say anything, but anything that you say may be taken down and used in evidence. Well, that, anyone can understand that. And they changed that to make it easier uh, or rather to threaten 
to threaten uh, arrested people. They started saying, uh, you don't have to say anything. But if you choose not to say anything, the court may infer something from the fact that you haven't said it. In other words, it's a threat. Now, I think that's wrong. I think that is a... a um, an attack on, on somebody's human rights because people are vulnerable when they're um, in the hands of the police and they're being arrested. So, um, uh, so what we've done is made it easier to convict in a certain way because you can get more con uh, confessions out of people that way. But on the other hand, once they, they are convicted, you don't do anything. Hmm. Well, this is this is exactly the wrong way around. Hmm. So we get everything exactly the wrong way around. Yeah. Um, look, I'm just about out of time, but I do just want to touch on your book, How Does Psychology Undermine Morality? Um, because, you know, it seems like every, uh, like you say, the common sense seems to be that, yes, prisons do serve a purpose. Deterrent does work because we know it works on ourselves. Um, people need to understand consequences. But... We seem to be up against sociologists, academia, criminologists who say, no, prisons don't work, deterrence doesn't work. Um, and your book, uh, let me just read the explanation because I did chuckle to myself as I read it. Uh, you say, most psychological explanations of human behavior are not only ludicrously inadequate oversimplifications, they are socially harmful in that they allow those who believe in them to evade personal responsibility for their actions and to put the blame on a multitude of scapegoats, on their childhood, their genes, their neurochemistry, even on evolutionary pressures. And then you say, instead, they promote self-obsession without self-examination and the gross overuse of medicines that affect the mind. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting, uh, because, I mean, you're really challenging the whole psychology that's going on, the research that's coming out, and as I've just highlighted of a couple of papers that I highlighted to the um, MPs yeah. on the select committee, some of the conclusions yeah. they come to just do not make common sense. And yet we're the ones who are made to be, uh, who are made to be thought that we don't understand human nature. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, just in a yeah. reader's well, digest, I, I, what was your book basically saying? Well, what it was basically saying was that psychology doesn't actually uh, help us in self-understanding, but rather gets in the way of it, which is not, I, I mean, I don't want to uh, to be absolute in the sense that I was a psychiatrist and I did see uh, criminals who were mad and had committed crimes because they were mad. Yeah. And, that, and that needs to be dealt with differently. Uh, but you need judgment, uh, proper judgment, as to who those persons are. And when you attempt uh, all these junk, I mean, all these uh, psychological exp um, explanations are really fashions. They go in and out of fashion, or particularly out of fashion, because they're, they're absurd. So we have behaviorism, we have psychoanalysis, we have neurochemistry, and this will go on long, long, long. Um, and, and yet, of course, we know that the fundamental cause of crime is what it has always been, which is the decision to commit it. And indeed, if there is no decision to commit it, there is uh, no crime committed, because you actually need to have decided to do it for there to be a crime. And of course, it's and, expanding, and, isn't it? Because it's going to no prisons. And now, of course, we're getting movements like in the United States of defunding the police. It's all heading for yeah. disaster, isn't it? <laughs> it, has, well, it has been a disaster. I mean, the thing is that they don't care that the murder rate has, in, in some cities, has doubled. I mean, in a, in a year or, or at least gone up very significantly. And, very, and, and violent crimes uh, have risen enormously. Again, which is, this will surprise only criminologists. Yeah. So, look, just one final question, and, and I think from our perspective, you know, we believe that people can change, um, that, that people can be rehabilitated, but it does take a lot of work and, and a lot of undoing of damage that may have been done, bad choices that are made, drug use perhaps, which I'm sure you came across a lot uh, in your journeys between the hospital and the prison. Um, how can we make that change um, happen better for... Well, see, I'm, I'm very... Scared. 
yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very skeptical about the, the what we what we can actually uh, achieve uh, except by time because people do I mean when we say people can change uh, not only can they change they do change so we know that because people's behavior does change in time what we want to do of course is accelerate uh, the the change so that uh, but i'm not convinced that we we have a kind of magic way of turning um turning people uh, more quickly in a, a good direction but what do you regard think, what do you think we need to offer them at least well, what I would like to do is, uh, I mean, and I never managed to achieve this, of course. Uh, I, uh, one of the things I believe where uh, it's um, possibly a bit far-fetched is that our popular culture is criminogenic. So that, for, the, for example, the music that people listen to, I don't know what people listen to in New Zealand. The same. Yeah, but it's highly agitating. Often the often the the words when you can make them out are unbelievably horrible. Mm. I mean, uh, well, it's a glorification and, of gang life, isn't it? At uh, all that kind of thing, uh, yes. you know, uh, guns and uh, that whole culture. Now, mm. there, there. When you try and get prisoners to do something that I would say is better, superior, mm. actually. They begin to appreciate it. They've never been exposed to anything better than their horrible popular culture. Mm. And that is the kind of thing that I would like to do. We had a writer in the prison who, of course, this affected only a selected group of people and so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, and he got them to write, and of course, uh, everyone who starts out writing writes autobiographically, and they eventually came to their commission of their crimes, mm. and they suddenly realised that they had a block because they realised that everything they'd been telling themselves about themselves was false. Mm. Now, um, that's the kind of activity I, I would like to see, but I don't have any scientific evidence to say, well... Uh, if you if you do this kind of thing, they stop committing crimes. But I think it's certainly worth an effort. Uh, and um, I mean, I am. And to give you another example, um, we had um, a, 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 a prison officer of Jamaican, of Jamaican origin in our prison, and he discovered that changing the music that people listened to or heard change their behaviour, which, again, doesn't altogether surprise me. But if he played Baroque music, uh, they calmed down. And if they were allowed to have their agitating, uh, vile music, uh, they were agitated and, um, and aggressive. So I think I would like to see cultural activities in prison. Right. And... and and there are many people who, there are many people of goodwill who would be willing to try and help in that way. Mm. But it's rather difficult for them. Yeah. Look, I'm sure this debate will continue, but I, I thank you for your input. It's been good. I think it'll be important for our audience to hear um, your side and to understand uh, some of the narrative that we're not hearing in the general media and from political circles at the moment. So, uh, Tony, um, thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully, maybe we can get you back. Uh, one day, actually, I did notice that you were published in our mainstream media about two years ago, and it was when you wrote an article on being in Paris at the start of the lockdown at the beginning of 2020. Uh, yes. I think it was an article out of the Telegraph or the or one of the UK newspapers. So yes. thought that that was the last time that people had heard your name in New Zealand. So uh, yes. here you are again. So uh, yes. our love to you and Agnes, and um, and you know, thank you for your input.